Okay, I, I think I think it's done. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, let me thank the organizers <coughs> for bringing me to Vancouver. Thanks. It's a, it's a nice place. I really feel home here, and uh, it's also a good opportunity that we meet here after four years Beijing conference in person to discuss several things. So I'm really happy to be here. So um, the last talk. You have seen some pioneering experiments on Higgs spectroscopy. I had two more words here because now I tell you my story on the, on the theory side. And in particular, I start uh, uh, with the chapter how to activate the Higgs mode, also a little bit historical part. Then I give you some insights on the classification, on, on uh, our ideas on that, some, uh, some time for highlights, I hope. And at the end, I want to share with you some ideas uh, how this field, uh, I hope, and will develop in, in the near future. But before I'm doing it, let me, uh, of course, thank all my coworkers. This is uh, uh, my, my group in Hamburg. Some of them are here. Simon has a poster on, on Thursday. Some of them have recently left. Uh, we have collaborations with the uh, previous speaker and the next speaker and, and their teams. And uh, uh, from the UBC side, let me in particular mention Rafael Henel, who is one of our joint PhD students between two continents and also some Ex experimental support from Michael Rupphausen and his Raman team in, in Hamburg. So how to activate the Higgs mode? We have seen a little bit in, in, the, uh, in the first talk. Let me start by saying if you open your favorite textbooks on, on, on uh, uh, collective modes in condensed matter, you will find many examples, phonons, magnons, and so on. And there is no chapter on, on superconductivity because uh, it's too fresh, too, too young uh, uh, topic, actually. And I will show to you that is the, the Higgs mode I'm talking about. We will actually see there's some relation between, between this and the other modes. Say phonons are so sensitive to, to the uh, group uh, point group symmetry, while, while these modes are sensitive to the symmetry of the order parameter, for example. So there's an analogy, and we also can do uh, now it's getting louder here. Now we can also do maybe some, some many body uh, effects and so on between these modes. So in the, in the 90s when pump probes started, let's say on semiconductors, I followed this a little bit. And, and uh, 10 years later, uh, this was also done on high TC on, on correlated systems. And this was the conventional setup, say for pump probe uh, uh, experiments. This is, was some pioneering work by Kindle's PSD cheeses. So you see the change of the optical conductivity here. And this is some kind of excitation relaxation mechanism. So I was very impressed when I, when I saw that. Um, on the other hand, I was also disappointed because I didn't learn anything about the gap itself, didn't learn anything about the order parameter. So actually the conventional explanation if this is in terms of phonons, some avalanche effect here and some, some bottleneck uh, mechanism on the other side, so-called Rothfuss-Taylor dynamics. So I was a little bit uh, disappointed. I want to learn more about the ground state uh, of the system. So I proposed already in 2008, let's shake the superconducting condensate uh, by light. So in particular, what this means, let's go for an collective excitation, I told you. And um, please use melee electron volt, so use terahertz light. And if you don't want to break all the pairs, please use also small fluids. So do it exactly the opposite. And you can guess what experimentalists told me, not possible. Yeah. OK, so then a few years later, uh, it was almost possible. So they asked for more details. So this was my proposal. This is a very old slide now, more than in 10 years, maybe almost 15 years ago. Um, this is a cartoon um, of the Mexican head as a function of time. And here are some early calculations. So we have seen this a little bit in the first talk. So if you have a, uh, uh, here's the delta versus time shown in red, but there's also in the dash line is the, is the uh, uh, a pump pile or the quench pile, so the pump pile. So you see, if it's if it's short in time, uh, shorter at least than one over two delta, uh, then you have this displacement of the Cooper pair somehow. And even if it's a single cycle, you switch it off. This goes up and down automatically, forever in theory, if there's no other dissipation or so. If you do it slowly, the adiabatic way, so if the pulse is broad, the delta just goes down because you shrink it, you break some pairs, and, and that's it, basically. That's more the adiabatic way. And uh, this was already the, the birth in 2008, I would say, on, on, on Higgs predictions. And uh, we worked out the theory in more detail. So this delta function of time, this goes on forever. Uh, so we call it delta infinity. And now you ask many, what's the frequency of this guy? It's actually this value times two, actually. It's so pretty simple. This is for S-wave superconductors. 
And uh, so if you have stronger fluence, you break maybe more pairs and end up here. Less fluence, you break you end up here with some oscillations. So the frequency is always different, but always the same formula, basically. So this was a paper in 2008, but now it's an exercise in my lecture, and students love it because it's very easy to solve, actually. And it's easy to solve because you just have a minimum model. You have some kind of uh, BCS starting point. You couple uh, with light let's say a dipole term, which is uh, not so often used. I come back to this later. You need most of the time nonlinear coupling, you need two photons to activate Higgs. But in the end of the day, you calculate, let's say in Eliasberg language, you calculate this anomalous Green's function f, and you sum everything up to get the delta of t. And actually, you map this to sort of the pseudospin model, which is the Bloch equation model, and this you can easily solve. And this you would see on this conference, I think, many times in this workshop, the pseudospin model. And so this is easy to solve. But at that time, it was some kind of nice prediction in 2008. So five years later, they have measured this. Shimano has measured this. Uh, so why this was so difficult, actually? It looks so nice in theory. Uh, here, a bit more details why it took so long. So not only a short time is needed. This is a cartoon of the optical conductivity. I also uh, recommend to put this inside the gap, of course. And, and if it's short in time, it's short in energy, you also break some pairs. And otherwise, if you put it here somewhere, then you break too many, maybe, and you get some drood absorption, whatever, you cannot maybe not see it or so. So it's maybe also another difficulty to put this inside, inside uh, uh, the gap. And finally, you have to remember, uh, photons, uh, Cooper pairs have no dipole moments. We need two photons to activate the Higgs uh, mode. So this is well known as this different tree and some frequency generation. So finally, you break some pairs, and then you kick it. Uh, like you snip a pendulum, for example. So this was the, the concrete uh, this, uh, the prediction. So a few years later, a theory colleagues in Tokyo came up with another mechanism. They call it drive. Um, not so specific uh, uh, um, conditions on the piles, just uh, multi-cycle, and the light is always on and not so short. And uh, the cartoon would be like this. So it's more or less elastic because the E is, is somehow in between, uh, in, in the, fully in the gap. So this was done by Aoki, Sensei, and, and Suji. So this is more single cycle physics, multi-cycle. If you wish, this is the non-adiabatic side, and this is more the, the adiabatic version of activating the hits. We have just seen this in Shimano's talk. So you can call this, if you want, some kind of steady state non-equilibrium. Yeah. Let's take this off. OK. This is rubbing. Yeah, thanks. OK, so let me quickly summarize this, this part. We have this quenching and this driving mechanism. And how do you see it? We just have seen uh, the uh, early experiment by Shimano. So you see uh, different frequencies because fluence dependence, but always the same formula. And how to see the driving? It's the third harmonic uh, signal he just described. And usually the third harmonic is small, but below TC, it's boosted under some condition. You need two photons. And now we have uh, eigenfrequency of the Mexican head, two delta, and under this condition, this is boosted below TC, and this has been seen five years after the prediction. And there's a nice paper also recently on this. If you have a special piles, not some symmetric piles, some asymmetric piles, you can do both at the same time if you want. So some highly asymmetric piles can quench and drive. Very nice uh, paper uh, to do this. So I, um, he mentioned also a third way. There's a supercurrent. I come back to this in, in a moment. I have also some thoughts over the years about a third uh, um, possible activation that is called, also other people, a recent one, uh, uh, this is called incoherent activation. This means by, by incoherent phonons, so emission of incoherent phonons. And uh, so some of the authors are here. So I appreciate uh, the, this early work here. And um, so please remember, uh, this is a, um, a few selection of experiment. This looks like the kind of, you know, excitation, relaxation, but on top, you see some oscillation, the author at that time already concluded this may be Higgs, so in the reflectivity. However, this is not seen in, in, in S-wave superconductors, for example. So the answer is, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. But let me point out uh, another experiment even earlier at that time. Um, this was, I think, pioneering work by the Rüpphausen group because it was the first ever pram program and scattering with two-color optical light on high-TC superconductors. This is the B1G pair-breaking peak. And there's so two time scales, you know. This is the Raman shift on the y-axis and the time here. Then you see two time uh, scales. One is, of course, the breaking of the pair, some, some quasi-particle. And the other one at that time was more attributed to phonons. It was very popular at that time. But maybe, maybe not. Maybe they already saw 
the Higgs uh, 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 time scale at this time, because this would be consistent with this experiment, because we also pump probe uh, Raman data. So I come back to this at the end. So maybe we can learn something from the older data here as well. Now classification of the Higgs mode. So far this was just S-wave. Let me go one step further uh, to D-wave and, and uh, yeah, so we worked out the details uh, on this part. It's all, all published. So uh, in, in, in S-wave there's only one mode. It's, 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 uh, uh, everything is, um, uh, say, uh, constant and K-space. And so here we have the, the uh, D-wave order parameter. And now you can easily imagine uh, uh, the, in, the direction of the light matters, right? So to activate the Higgs mode, how you, how you kick the condensate is now important. Uh, Antinodal or nodal direction, at least for this uh, simple linear polarized light. So if you work out the details, let's say for the D-wave uh, high TC condensate, you get even four modes. And uh, so just to make sh sure, someone asked me, is this, these are not orbitals, right? These are really the order parameter wave function for a D-wave superconductor. So we classify them uh, in according to this point group symmetry. But this reminds you, of course, to phonon classification scheme, right? This is like a character table of phonons, if you wish, or just group theory. So you see here, for example, the symmetric mode, all arrows are out. Next time step, they're all in. And here is the anti-symmetric mode. This the red one goes in, the blue one goes out, the next time step is vice versa and so on. So let me show you how this looks in time, basically. This is some mini animation here, how these uh, uh, parameter oscillations look like. This is some kind of generalization of this little oscillations I showed you earlier. So, so uh, you quench or drive the system with some excitation. Let's say red is pull and, and, and blue is push, for example. And then you can do this for any order parameter you like. And uh, for D-wave, this was the symmetric one, for example. And here's the anti-symmetric one I just shown to you earlier. So this somehow is, is a nice animation. And I think the beauty of this table somehow I come to the theory part in more detail maybe, but the beauty of this table you can see already is um, choose your favorite method if you want to study Higgs. Say uh, time-dependent reflectivity, time-dependent uh, uh, care effect, time-dependent absorption. And in all these equations you're using, there will be a delta of time you know, included. So take this uh, as an input and see what's coming out, what you can expect in your experiment. Second beauty of this table, if, if there's a new superconductor discovered tomorrow, and also Shimano mentioned this a little bit, some, some things are unknown in, in, in iron nictides, maybe S plus ID or S plus minus or so, uh, just do the calculation and see how they look like, and maybe you can discriminate right away uh, in, in on your optical table somehow, whether it's this candidate or that candidate realized. So I think this is, uh, of course I understand this is the romantic view of theory, right? In, in reality, there will be you know, many things uh, happening, other modes, uh, and, and maybe charge density wave nearby, and so on. So, but it, this is a toolbox, I think, for experimentalists, yeah. So this is the theoretical version of this. I don't go through the table here. Uh, let me just mention, uh, in principle, you calculate this f function for all momenta. So strictly speaking, there's a continuum of Higgs mode. Every k point oscillates, and you sum this up uh, in, K, in K space, and then you can tell us how many modes and so on, and, and, and which energy they are related. So I think this is a nice uh, uh, toolbox. So then I have just a few minutes to, to see some highlights. Uh, Shimano mentioned uh, there's also some supercurrent uh, activation. We have done some papers on this. So uh, uh, this is some kind of DC component. Uh, in, in the Raman process and, and looks like infrared finally because you have one extra omega equal to zero uh, component. So we worked out the details. It's, it's nice, it's possible. And if you love MGB2, they have maybe two Higgs uh, oscillations they can meet, also the phase mode, and, and they can all interact. So just have a look into these uh, papers if you want. And then Simon is giving a poster here on these new superconductors. And uh, maybe ARPIS might be interesting in the near future because time resolved already exists. We have some experts in the audience, but it was never done with terahertz. So you need to kind of quench ARPIS if you want, but this was not done yet. So maybe next year or so people tell me it's possible to do this or so. So then you can see maybe K resolved Higgs oscillation, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so one final uh, um, point on this highlight, say, 
uh, uh, Stefan Kaiser and his team, they have measured, uh, as, as mentioned before, this uh, third harmonics here very systematically. I didn't put any material here because they measure this for basically all high TC superconductors, doping dependence, and so on. And what they see is somehow that there's a phase difference between third and first harmonics, and not even this as a function of temperature, they even phase jumps actually. And, and uh, they have recorded. And this reminded us immediately. Uh, that we have some coupling to another mode, maybe charge density wave. Uh, and at some point, if the amplitude, even also you're driving, tends to zero, then there's some anti-resonance uh, possible. So you can work on the details here. I don't claim it's uh, completely agreeing with all the experimental data, but I think we learned how to do uh, many body theory, Dyson equations, and so on. This is just one equation. You have, you have to solve more, of course. And at the end, you calculate this combined signal, do some cuts, and get here some, some anti-resonance and so on. So I think in the future, if you would have more data, frequency dependent and data, for example, we can learn more to use the Higgs maybe as a sensor to check what other modes are doing somehow. This is, I think, uh, interesting for the future, but so far, it's just a model calculation, I would say. Okay, so how much doing in time for the rest of the part? Okay. okay. So um, I want to share some, some thoughts with you on the, on the last part. So uh, this first one is a very important question to me because uh, Andrea is sitting in the audience. We have heard about many years on induced superconductivity. And my question is, is this really true? And so far we have just the textbook equilibrium criteria used. Sigma one has a gap and sigma two looks to be divergent. But I think we need a new criterion here. A um, bit more not so ambitious question uh, asked by the previous speaker is uh, how to distinguish um, quasi particles from the broken pairs from the Higgs mode that is oscillating. Um, I personally had, well, I tried to avoid this question for many years because I said, okay, so what? Please quench. Then you see some oscillations directly. <laughs> but not so easy in experiment, I realized. Also, if the effect is small, smaller than this, I didn't care too much because it's visible. You know, you can, even if it's small, I mean, nonlinear optics is always small. Yeah, care effect is always small. But I understand this is an important point for many people to distinguish. And, and so, so I think one direction one should go is uh, two-dimensional coherent spectroscopy, which was done decades ago for, for semiconductors. Four-wave mixing is, is one word, but now let's do it for superconductors. Yeah. So the easy, what is 2D spectroscopy? The easiest way, of what we, how we learned it, uh, we combine these two things, quench and dry, with some you know, time delay and, and uh, do some two-dimensional map. Uh, here's the frequency of the result versus time delay. And you see already some modulation here. This is because of the driving part. And if you do also full transformation of the x-axis of the time delay, you have this omega, omega plot. And you can identify first harmonics, third harmonics, and so on. And also other peaks. I have no time to go into the details. And these peaks are not only Higgs, because you have drive, you also see quasi-particles. So it's nice to learn this, but it's not the way to discriminate between both. I think the way to discriminate between both is something that Shimano has done, and also Stefan Kaiser will show in the next, uh, on the next uh, talk. Somehow you need an extra pulse, maybe uh, some extra pump, third harmonic. And now I put some optical pulse here. And you would say, maybe, wait a minute. In the beginning, you convinced me we need terahertz pulse. Uh, but to activate Higgs, this is true. But now we want to break some pairs by, by purpose, you know, to see the difference between the two excitations. Now you want to break by purpose. So the old third harmonic is basically elastic. Two, three photons in, one out. This is the microscopic Feynman version of this. Now if you have uh, an extra pulse, an extra pulse, then you change the quasi-particle contribution here. Yeah. So light here, light couples directly to the quasi-particles, the, the optical pump. And you see, you cannot use the uh, standard Green's function technique. You have to really go to non-equilibrium Kalish technique. And this is what, what we did. So you can calculate this, these things. Uh, this is the, uh, just a quasi-particle in the interest of time, just a quasi-particle part. And this, uh, this one is going down. This one is going down as well. So finally, what you calculate is the density of states, for example, and the signal itself. And you see it becomes asymmetric. So this two delta quasi-particle contribution is drastically reduced already. Yeah. So this is just a quick and dirty uh, Kalish calculation. It tells you, uh, um, yes, I think it's possible to discriminate. Just, just uh, calculate all these details. You can calculate this bubble alone and this bubble alone. You can calculate this and this separately. And then you, to discriminate, I think, theoretically, 
it's a, it's a straight way and non-equilibrium to distinguish between. Then maybe this discussion becomes not so hot any longer. Okay, so time is almost up. So let me just mention one final word um, on this experiment I showed in the beginning because the conclusion, or say you are an expert on this, was already uh, um, that stimulated Raman is involved somehow in this process. So you have this phonon in the back and you see already all the parameter oscillations here. And it was not so appreciated by, by the community, I think, this experiment. So I don't go through all the possibilities here. I don't go through all the possibilities here. Let me just uh, mention, uh, I wanted to follow up this idea and go back to the Raman experiment by, by Rüphausen, who saw these two time scales of the B1G peak. So this, I think, pump of Raman for me, I think is the, the third is the third ingredient uh, that we need. Not only quench and drive. I think pump of Raman is one of the key methods in the future. This was a very early experiment. Two time scales here. Shimano had done uh, a similar uh, experiment. Now with uh, this is two optical. Here is one terahertz laser involved. He sees this oscillatory behavior. And but let me remind you, this oscillatory behavior means in the energy domain just a peak. This is equilibrium Raman from the 90s. Yeah. So let me stick out, my, stick out my neck here and say, if, if this is all true, and also your experiment is correctly interpreted, then you must see it also in conventional Raman spectroscopy, in steady state, optical, incoherent. And maybe it was already there, we just didn't notice. So I, I showed this idea last month to Kenneth Birch, and he said, well, no surprise for me. We, all, we have seen charge density wave Higgs uh, yeah, also in, in our ra classical Raman experiment. So it's, he said, no surprise. Uh, it's possible. So let me sharpen my argument again. This here is the fit by Tom Devereaux at that time, the best he could do. This is just quasi-particle fit. But we already know from 15 years later experiment, this guy here is, has two components. Not only quasi-particle, it has two components in time, basically. And I think I showed you in this talk, you know, they are B1G oscillations, so there is a relation. And A1G is even larger in our calculation in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this group theory. A1G is even larger. So I think putting all this together without giving you some number, this is, of course, a difficult task. Um, I think, let me stick out my neck and say, there was Higgs all the time, maybe. And we couldn't realize, because we need some time dependence to look behind this picture somehow. Maybe it was there for 25 years and we didn't notice, actually. So the uh, chairman is standing up, so let me one minute summarize. Uh, I show you how, you how you quench and how you drive. This was my early prediction. Uh, spectroscopy means at least you can classify and maybe some predictive power of this table. And I didn't show you all the details of the highlights. You can ask me later. But I think in the future direction to answer these questions of Andrea in use superconductivity and, and the question that was asked here, discrimination between quasi-particles and so on. Maybe you should just do non-equilibrium calculation and then be more serious somehow to, to uh, answer these questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. OK, it's open for questions. So I have two related questions. One yes. is the D wave. Mm -hmm. what, is this, what is the frequency of the Higgs in the D wave? Um, well, we have an A1G oscillation. It's a bit that's close to 2 delta. Oh, but and you have nodes, right? So what yeah. is 2 delta? Yeah, the maximum 2 delta. So, so you have. So this is like the balas Schwarma paper, basically. So you have to in. So you have to integrate over all k. So because you have this gap equation, so we have some kind of interference. Sometimes it's you know, positive, sometimes negative, and then you get these four modes. So you have four modes, finally, that are possible to observe for a D-wave super. But they're not sharp, right? Because no, they are broad. They are broad. Very broad. And, yeah. Some of them, you, there are some clapping modes you cannot easily observe. But B1G, A1G, you know, this linear polarized light. And we have calculated, I have no slide maybe uh, how, how big they are, actually. They are smaller than S-wave because of the nodes because they have damping and so on. Right. So it's good to amplify them, but they are there. So uh, even and, if you can. OK, and then you said yeah. that in the Raman in Bisco, they see uh, 500 centimeters minus 1 peak. Yeah, right? so this is the usual 2 delta. 2 delta marks the antinodal interpretation. Yeah. What we know already, this is the same experiment on this peak, right. but now two time scales. But there's an yeah, even yeah, much yeah. older experiment of sigma in the in mid-infrared shoulder, as the okay. old opticians can remember. 
And that's also 500 centimeters minus okay. one. Okay. So let's so sit down and discuss this. So it might be just uh, yeah. that it was always observed in the I infrared, think, mid yeah. infrared. Peak. And also in your experiment, this was also quite early somehow you proposed. This. So I think something is overlooked in all yeah. these years. It's not just quasi particle here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we proposed yeah. that that 500 <laughs> centimeters minus one might be, might be the Higgs in the yeah, cooperates. Okay. But uh, this thanks. you say is more convincing. Let's sit down and discuss it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks yeah, for the comments. I have a question over yeah. here. And uh, we are. We have, uh, our phase has lagged considerably. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna go into the, uh, into the break, uh, clearly. And uh, I think in the interest of discussion, I will uh, have one more question before we get to Stefan, if that, and, then, yeah. and then we'll just uh, yeah. cut into the break. We talk after the break, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, two questions, uh, first is probably related to us, is even in S-way superconductors, there's a gap in isotropy. It could be like 10% even more in aluminum. In reality, yeah. In reality, right. <laughs> yeah. So then what is, uh, what is the Higgs uh, frequency there and uh, dissipation? So if it exceeds the minimum delta, to yeah. is it the depth? What's not? Uh, I you didn't calculate, but we can do this in you know, 15 minutes or so, high harmonics, no problem. So okay. just ask me tomorrow. Okay. This is pretty easy. I, thanks for the question. We never did this, yeah. This is... We have just a romantic calculation here. Okay. Yeah, higher modes, uh, yeah, no problem. Okay, and the second question, uh, there were experiments in microwave absorption in the 70s, Garfunkel, mm -hmm. Budzinski, they also saw a structure near two delta. I see. Uh, is it related to Higgs or could it be? Well, I have to check the details to be honest, but, but uh, um, I think all the interpretations I've shown to you were somehow, you know, fashionable at that time, you know, in Korean phonons or whatsoever or so. But if you put them together just by logic, I think, there's something hidden, and, and uh, so the, the message is here, please reproduce this experiment now for A1G, or reproduce this one for, for smaller targets for quench or so. Then you would already gain some insights or so on all these earlier peaks and so on. So I think it's up more an experimental question now. I've put all the things together, but it's more a question to you to, to verify this, yeah. Oh, last question, yeah. Andre. <laughs> uh, a simple question about theory, not about experiment, although I understand it's forbidden to ask this Thanks. question. Uh, when you do calculations of Raman, and this about uh, B1G for D-wave case, mm -hmm. you definitely have uh, two delta peak yes, coming yeah, from a standard I, I do, Raman. Yeah. Plus on top of this, there is a yeah. Higgs response. Yeah. What's the percentage of Higgs response? Uh, here it's pretty small, pretty small, because this mode is pretty small compared to A1G oscillation. The, the symmetric one is always the largest. So it's in this respect, one. original interpretation is that this is a standard Raman two delta peak yeah. is probably correct. Right? Let me, yeah, it's basically correct. But if, even if it's just 5%, come on. I mean, it's 5% <laughs> of this peak somehow. So I think one has to redo this fit completely. Because at that time, one wants to have some, some massage of the parameters, T, T prime, as you know, to fit this as best as you can and so on. So you see some of these guys going to, to zero any longer here and so on. I think they... <laughs> took, they took the best somehow. I think just repeat this again with you know new, new insights, and then we will see there's a little bit left. I think. Yeah. Okay, we'll need to move on. So let's thank. Uh, Thanks. Thanks. Speaker. Yeah.